Hi, I'm Aaron from Living Science Videos. There are two ways that life could persist. We could either have one immortal organism that could always repair itself and survive anything and everything forever under any conditions anywhere, which isn't really possible, or that single cell could reproduce more cells, which would reproduce more cells in turn and so on and spread all over the place. That's a much better way to do it, especially if there was a way for those cells to adapt to different environmental conditions. Living cells, and even some viruses, have DNA, which are the chemical instructions on how to make and run the cell. There are control features in the cell replication, such that it's supposed to reproduce the same way all the time, but, but there, there are, are still occasional, occasional errors, mutations, mutations which, which usually make, make very, very slight, slight changes. changes. Despite these controls, this happens pretty regularly and could happen every time the cell divides, such that every cell might be just a tiny bit different than the one next to it. The way one cell divides into two and then four and then so on means that these occasional mutations are inherited by the next generations too, so that these subtle changes build up over time as these organisms keep reproducing their own mu unique mutations and then adding more to them. So closely related bacterial cells in one area will share most of the same ancestral traits and will usually be almost completely identical to each other, but they will be noticeably different from much more distantly related cells somewhere else, and they all might be noticeably different from their distant ancestors back in time. As unique mutations continue to occur in each group, they'll be increasingly different from each other. This is called genetic drift, and it is the slowest form of evolution. Natural selection is a little faster and it applies a sort of design. That's where these subtle differences might leave some cells either better adapted or less capable of functioning, especially under variable conditions in different environments. Those that don't do so well will usually be weeded out pretty quickly, thinning out or disappearing altogether, while slighter, better arrangements will persist longer and produce more. So after many generations, you'd expect that some of them would get pretty efficient at what they do, and after enough generations, all of them would be. Biologists marvel at the complexity and efficiency of the cell, and rightly so. But you've got to remember that single cells reproduce very quickly. A single bacteria might produce a billion more in a single day. How many different mutations occur in that time? Now remember how many days there are in a year. And then think about this. We have bacterial microfossils dating back 3.8 billion years, and maybe even older. How many generations of mutations is that? That's at least several million mutations a day with organisms spread all over the world. So natural selection runs trillions of incidental experiments of trial and error, genetic tinkering, tweaking and testing every little variance again and again and again for billions of years, discarding the worst and keeping the best. For 80% of the history of life on Earth, the most advanced organisms were only microscopic microbes with some lines gradually improving while others fade away. By the time they eventually began to combine into multicellular organisms, the inner workings of those cells were elaborate and refined to near perfection. DNA controls the individual cells very well, but the multicellular organisms are another matter with many more options. So they evolve faster in terms of number of generations, but the generations are a lot longer too because they live a lot longer, so it doesn't seem like it. Another difference between multicelled and single-celled organisms is that single cells are susceptible to horizontal gene transfer. That's where two cells have the ability to swap portions of their DNA on contact just by crashing into each other in particular ways. This doesn't happen all the time either, but it can, and when it does, it can immediately produce really dramatic changes in those individual cells. But that's not such an issue for multicellular organisms like us because horizontal gene transfer only affects that cell and the descendants of that cell. It can't affect the other cells in your body and it won't affect your descendants unless it affects the right cell, the one that becomes a sperm or egg. If you look at the way sperm and egg interact, that is a specific form of horizontal gene transfer called conjugation. This is the cellular basis of sexual reproduction. Here, different sets of compatible DNA are mixed together. Commonalities overlap, of course, but it also combines different sets of unique mutations. Sexual reproduction consequently results in a much faster evolution than asexual reproduction ever could. So which one is a better reproductive strategy? Asexual reproduction happens when a single parent organism reproduces most often genetically identical offspring to itself. More often than not, single cells like bacteria produce identical copies of themselves. However, fission of unicellular organisms isn't the only type of asexual reproduction. The survival advantage of asexually multiplying clones of yourself more rapidly than other species is that it is easier to compete for resources. However, if there is an environmental change, like a change in climate, and a species doesn't have the genetic traits to survive in the new temperature, it could become extinct. 
That's why it's good to be able to produce like most plants, in both ways. Most animals produce sexually, but not all of them. For example, in these ponds in the Mexican desert, there are two visually similar species of minnows living side by side. One is a group of sexual reproducers, and the other is an entirely female asexual species that reproduce parthenogenically, without males, without sex. But that is the slowest form of evolution, and this leaves them susceptible to parasites and pathogens, whereas the sexual reproducers fare better because they have the advantage of greater genetic diversity. Sex is the best defense against rapidly evolving enemies. Now here's a comment on sexual and asexual reproduction from Micro Ra. Why is it that the birds and the bees are always brought up when we talk about the basic principle of sexual and asexual reproduction? Seriously, some bees reproduce asexually. And what do avian dinosaurs have to do with it? However, something that dinosaurs are often confused with, lizards feel a specific species that legitimately clones itself. Nemodophorus neomexicanus, or whatever that C in at the beginning is supposed to sound like commonly known as the New Mexico with tail. It's a state reptile. This entirely female species is one of the few vertebrate animal species that reproduces by producing offspring all by itself. Of course, it can also crossbreed with males of other with tail, but this species is generally asexual. This might sound impossible, and it pretty much is with our current understanding of this creature, as we have very little knowledge as to why this happens. What we do know is that it has doubled the number of chromosomes, masses of DNA, as normal with tails at the start of the reproductive process. Asexual reproduction sounds like it's worse than sexual reproduction due to the lack of biodiversity. However, it has a key benefit. You do not need a mate. Many plants take advantage of asexual reproduction. It's called vegetative propagation. And you can try this at home. Potatoes reproduce asexually through a process called budding. Maybe you have seen the growths on potatoes that are commonly called eyes. You can cut those off a potato, take a sliver that has about three eyes on it, plant that in four inches of dirt with the eyes fading up, and voila, a new potato. Many plants take advantage of having both asexual and sexual reproductive capabilities, having the ability to populate without other plants and pollinators. Like this thing, also called Mother of Millions, Mother of Thousands from Madagascar. You can see the plantlets running along its leaves. However, Plants still have the advantage of biodiversity due to still having sexual reproduction available due to the pollinators like the bees. Now the bees make sense, but the birds still don't. Oh, now I get it. We've covered genetic drift, natural selection, and the acceleration of genetic diversity and sexual reproduction. Another aspect of evolution is sexual selection, choosing the right mate. This is generally determined by the female, evaluating different potential suitors to see who has the best indications of health and symmetry, who would be the best provider, protector, or partner, and who is the most capable to pass on the best genes. This can also be determined by the male, but in a different way, by winning exclusive access to the females through superior rank or right of combat. In both instances, the top performers have the best chances, and ultimately, that produces the best results for the species as a whole. Mm -hmm.